Jessica Calderwood is one of our artist presenters. Jessica began her undergraduate, undergraduate education here at CIA focused on painting. She changed her major early on and created a successful career making jewelry, work for the wall, and um, sculpture in various materials. Upon graduation, she immediately applied to the John Kohler Arts and Industry Program, and at the time, she was the youngest um, resident that they had ever had to the program. She continued her education, um, receiving her MFA from the University of Arizona, and has since taught at the University of Wisconsin Oshkosh, and currently teaches at Ball State University. Her work's been exhibited exhibited nationally and internationally and included in numerous publications. Her work will also be included in the Think Craft Fresh Takes exhibit in November in the Rheinberger Gallery. If you didn't make it to her demo this morning, samples of her work will remain in the Jewelry and Metal Studio on view through Friday. So please join me in welcoming Jessica. Hi everybody, um, thank you so much for coming to my presentation and uh, thank you so much again to Gretchen, Matthew and Kathy for inviting me to come back. So I'm really humbled to be here in this new and sexy building too. So um, anyways, yeah, uh, Gretchen, thank you for the introduction too. And so I was born and raised uh, in the Cleveland area. I grew up in um, Euclid and Wycliffe and um, you know, I always knew I wanted to be in the arts, uh, and I wanted to be a painter. And as most people who are in, um, you know, high school, grade school, I was really only exposed to really a lot of 2D work. So I wanted to be um, in that world of painting and drawing. And um, it wasn't until I took an elective class with Gretchen Goss in enameling that I kind of found my tribe. And I wasn't expecting that. I didn't even understand that metalsmithing and jewelry was a field at that time. I was a pretty ignorant 20-year-old. And um, she really taught it in a special way. At that time, uh, enameling was a separate major. And so I was able to really focus on image making, um, but in this alternative material and substrate. And so anyways, that was an incredibly like special moment in terms of the program. So I, I'll just, I promise I'm not gonna show you everything I ever made, but um, I was really focusing on wall relief work and my work, if I could think about a thread that really ties everything together um, in my studio practice, it's, it's really autobiographical work. You know, my work is about life and my reactions to it and my hope is really that it's gonna resonate um, for a larger audience and it touched upon issues of of gender, um, identity, and um, cultural moments. So a lot of this work was relief forms that were um, talking about the body and how um, that moment can be beautiful and also grotesque. So I'm interested in contrast and tension in my work. So I did want to work larger. And when I was a student, I was kind of frustrated by scale. And if you're familiar with enamel, the process of using glass to metal, you're really limited by the size of your kiln or your torch. And so as I left and I wanted to find another place to work and another way to move my work forward, um, Gretchen introduced me to the Kohler residency. And I didn't know that much about the program, but I knew that they had kilns large enough to fire bathtubs. And so I knew I wanted to be there. So I went for a three-month residency. And if you are not familiar with the program, just a quick Cliff Notes version, it's in Sheboygan, Wisconsin, and it's one of the few family-owned uh, corporations that still exist in the United States. And there is a separate art center that is, um, works in tandem with the Kohler Company. So it's a, it's a brother and sister, and the sister runs the art center, the brother runs the corporation, and she's a real champion of arts, and especially folk arts. So you can have a residency either in iron foundry slash enamel or in um, porcelain ceramic slash slip casting. So I obviously chose iron and enamel and it was really amazing because it was a crash course in um, working in an entirely different metal, um, understanding casting and um, understanding how to enamel on that substrate which was completely different. So it was, it was really my intro to sculpture course at Kohler which was pretty unique. So 
it's kind of like glass blowing for um, metal in that when you're applying enamel to a, an, a casting, you're working hot constantly. So you preheat your work until it's glowing orange and then you apply the enamel and it fuses in front of your face and then you keep it hot. You're constantly keeping it up to temperature. And then once it cools, you're completely done and you cannot rework the piece. And so limitations really breed creativity and a new way of working and so uh, that was frustrating for me in the beginning because I really wanted to continue with this relationship between image and form in my work and I wasn't really able to do that in the same way and so I really just had to deal with form and structure and it sort of stripped away all the things that I thought were my assets and it was really an incredibly painful and important time in, in terms of the, the genesis of my work. So whatever I made there was kind of a residue of the experience, um, but it sort of sealed an idea in my mind that I wanted to move forward and study smithing in a way that I didn't really explore when I was at CIA. I wanted to understand how to move metal in order to gain control over sculptural forms. And so I ended up connecting with uh, an artist named David Pimentel. And I took a workshop with him at Aeromont, and he was a master of moving metal and smithing. And he taught it in a way that was really sort of intuitive and direct and, and not fussy. And so he um, kind of wooed me into coming to Arizona State, and I went through a three-year program and got my MFA with him. And um, it was a really interesting thing. I was talking to a, a CIA alum earlier today that culturally it was a big shift to come from CIA, which has amazing facilities, amazing kind of everything, um, and then coming to a state school where it was a really different culture, a really different way of thinking about my academic experience. And it kind of taught me to pick myself up from my bootstraps. And if I can't figure something out, I am going to just figure it out and open a book. So it was kind of a sink or swim program, but I think I really needed that in some way. So I started learning how to form, and I was um, still working with enamel. I was thinking about pieces that were more in the round. Um, this is an image of a wall work and then a detail shot on the right. So I was thinking about having these little vignettes or these moments of an image where you had to um, move your body and sort of interact with the piece in order to find them. I think I was still working with the idea of this contrast between beautiful and grotesque forms. I was thinking about the interior and the exterior of the body and what would that look like with these materials. And um, it was a really wonderful time of exploration. And um, even though the major in the MFA program was media specific, be because of the architecture of the space, everybody kind of moved very freely throughout the studio. So I felt really free to explore a lot of different materials besides metal. And so at a certain point, I realized that uh, metal wasn't saying what I needed it to say. And so I started working in the fibers program. And I started thinking about combining metal and fiber. And so this is one of the first pieces that I made that was kind of like pushing me outside of that comfort zone. And um, it's nylon mesh, which is a fancy word for pantyhose. So it's not that I was weaving or making anything, but it was more taking a found fiber and augmenting it and thinking about the pantyhose as a metaphor for skin and that it became this overlay on these body forms that I was creating. And I was really enjoying that. So this was one of the final installations that I made for my master's uh, thesis exhibition, which was called Drips. And it was a piece that you were meant to walk underneath and through. And uh, metalsmithing actually ended up taking a back seat to a lot of the work that I created for my final show, which was kind of interesting. Um, but it felt very freeing as well. Um, and then at the same time, I saw the work of Ernesto Nito, <laughs> which was looking a little bit similar and uh, kind of sealed for me the idea that I, even though I'm in the field of smithing, that I really needed to uh, be kind of current with what's happening in contemporary art, contemporary sculpture, um, and I, I, I loved the work of Ernesto Nito and um, ended up moving on to a sort of different direction. Uh, at the same time that I was working in my thesis program, I had started a sort of a, a piece a day kind of practice. And I think when you start in a new space or in a new 
direction with your work, sometimes it can be really intimidating to figure out what to make. So I started to make these little die forms. And so I ended up with hundreds of them and they became, they became my record of my time of my thesis um, explorations. And it was a really wonderful practice that, um, that I would recommend for a lot of students to explore. It became my time to work out imagery, to work out process in a way that didn't feel stressful to kind of move the objects beyond um, just what they were as these, um, these relief forms. So I know that's kind of become a, a thing on Instagram and other things, but I would highly recommend that students try it. Uh, so I ended up graduating in 2005 after that thesis exhibition, and I was in uh, the Phoenix suburbs and kind of figuring out where I want to go, literally and figuratively. And um, every time you grad, like you leave a place, a program, um, it's, it's kind of traumatic, you know, it's really hard. For those of you who are seniors and are kind of getting ready to go, look out, um, because it can be a complete head trip. So um, my answer for my undergrad was to go to a residency, and so I was in that same space of like not having a studio, not having a community, and so I ended up uh, creating a residency for myself at the Mesa Art Center. So that's a suburb of Phoenix. And this is a shot of the building. It was in construction right when I was graduating. And they didn't have a residency program, but I kind of accosted the person who was in charge of the metals area and I said, hey, uh, you need help setting up. I'm free. Would you like some help in exchange? Can I work here? And she said, absolutely, yes. So she was able to give me a space, which is that shot on the left side. And this was one of the classrooms. So it was this amazing complex that had separate spaces for enamel and lapidary. There was another room just for smithing and fabrication. And it ended up being a really uh, important place for me to be that was in a non-academic community. I was able to hone my teaching skills by um, covering introductory classes, something that I didn't have the opportunity to do in grad school, and, um, and really helped me move the work forward. And when you're in the crafts where things are so tool specific, it's really hard to be an island of yourself. So looking for residencies and places for you um, to stay part of your field is really important. So I spent about three years there, and because it was an art center, it was very jewelry centric which was not my world at that time. I had never even considered making something for the body, um, but part of the teaching those classes was that I had to teach jewelry. And so I knew the skills, but I actually had never made that much of it. So I ended up taking my iconography series and um, teaching myself really basic settings and understanding um, how to incorporate functionality into the work. And I think what happened was I realized that there's something really awesome about jewelry and that it, it, takes, um, it takes your work out of a really static space and it interacts with a moving form, a living form, and that my work was really much, very much about the body and I loved that interaction and it was really exciting to me and it, it's kind of stupid that it took me that long to figure that out. But um, it, was, it was a wonderful time for me to explore that. So I was honing some of my skills and craft again in a different way and also still exploring imagery. So in terms of my enamel process, I didn't really, my demo was really covering that. But for those of you who weren't there, this, this process is really an ancient technique in terms of how I render in enamel. And so it's very direct hand drawing. It's through lots of repeated layerings and firings in order to develop some of this um, like color, line, value. It's very direct. Um, so anyways, I was learning about kinetics. So this was a piece that swiveled, so it had a front and back element. And at that point, that's when I really started looking at jewelry and trying to find my place within this field. So I really admired the work of Diane Falkenhagen. I still love her work. And um, she's not an enamelist, but she's, she works in a variety of materials. These are, um, include polymer and other mixed metal. I also was looking at the work of Keith Lewis, not necessarily for technical, but the fact that he was working so autobiographically and that his work was so much about his personal life, his identity, his sexual orientation. And I was really, at the time, admiring the fact that his work was so raw that it was kind of like an open wound in a way and I and I was really interested in that and then I started looking to history and I started thinking about uh, the technical uh, elements of enameling and placing that within portrait miniatures 
So I started studying a little bit about how, um, how, that, how that material was applied, but then also the format of it. So I was kind of interested all of a sudden in, in stone setting and the mechanics of how elements are put together on that small scale. And um, so I gave myself some assignments. So when you're not in school, you actually miss it. So I gave myself an assignment to reinterpret the portrait miniature. And so this was one of the first pieces that I made. And it was actually for, um, it was also in tandem with an exhibition that was at Fichiri uh, Jewelry Gallery in Seattle, where they paired a, a jewelry artist with a literary artist. And so I made a piece, and then it was, the image was given off to this um, poet who then made a creative work from it and the works were exhibited together. And that really spurred on an entirely new group of works. And so what was nice was I was still living in Arizona, which had an amazing gems and minerals. So if you're familiar with the Tucson Gem Show, I was able to go there and I started really thinking about pairing like the stone with the image, you know, so with that past one, like the pill became a pearl and I started creating these works. So sometimes I'd make the image and go for a hunt for the perfect stone, and then sometimes I would work backwards and I would start with an object or the stone and then start to think about how I could have this relationship. And in terms of content, it had kind of shifted a little bit and I was um, really thinking about like creating these alluring images where there's these hand and mouth kind of gestures and thinking about this idea of consumption and at the time, it was something that was on my mind as a, as a cultural commentary, and the, the excess of it, and the, the ridiculous of it, and enjoyed the idea of ornamentation being a part of that conversation. So I was hoping it would resonate. And so at the same time that I was making these teeny tiny little two inch studies, I was also still working large scale. And I think at this time, um, and I talked to some of the students about it yesterday during critiques. Um, it, it became important to me to have a scale shift in the work as a way to have a conversation. And so the, the, the jewelry and the functional work was not a separate island from some of my larger wall works. And I wanted them to kind of work back and forth. And it wasn't as static as making a maquette in a small scale and then reinterpreting it. It felt really redundant, but it was more like I would make a large-scale work and I would say, oh, well, what would happen if I would crop that very slightly and I took a fragment of it and how would that image read differently? And so uh, this is kind of insincere in that it's sort of chronological, but really a lot of this work was kind of hanging off the walls all at the same time. So there's a side view of it. For those of you who are at the workshop, these were some of uh, the copper forms that were made on the bending break. And it's hard to show sometimes, but these are, um, these are sunk in sandbags, so they're kind of pillowy and, um, and convex. Um, a lot of the imagery that I was using was either from models, so I would have a photo shoot, so like this was my neighbor Rachel, who was a performance artist, and so she would do a lot of, um, a lot of poses for me that was kind of trying to get my ideas across. She hated this one, she hated the hot dog. Um, but uh, others were just ripped and appropriated from popular culture. This was actually from a YouTube video. Um, this was from this Romanian boy. He's like six years old and he could smoke like a champ. If you're interested, Google it. It's kind of amazing and heartbreaking at the same time. And um, this is the Marlboro Man, Ralph Warman. No, it really wasn't him, but um, I, was, I was also just, you know, Part of, part of craft is you know, thinking through the materials. And so for me, part of it is the content that I'm really interested in working through, but then there's always something technical that's kind of keeping me alive and interested and engaged in the studio. So I was looking at learning about foils and how can I inlay gold or silver and, and thinking about those materials having the meaning of consumption as something that's almost on a religious level at the time. Does that make sense? So thinking about um, those materials adding to the conversation. So that's all silver and gold foil inlay in the negative space. So anyways, uh, so I started thinking about format further and the series went on for a really long time, maybe too long, but um, I started thinking about, well, maybe why am I working in a square? And maybe that's just a crutch and maybe my, my work could have a slightly different format. So I started looking at porcelain and enamel 
um, platters and, and dinnerware objects and thinking about just changing the shape and maybe that's kind of pushing it a little bit, thinking about serving pieces. So contemporary works too, like Cindy Sherman, who was um, uh, obviously you know as a contemporary photographer, but had this lesser known series of um, China porcelain. So anyways, this was my first answer to that question. So I started hand sinking and raising copper plates and continuing the journey in terms of the subject matter. So yeah, and then just to check out, um, what was really nice at the Mesa Art Center was that for some reason at a certain point, like money was no object, so they were buying this amazing equipment. So they bought a 40 ton pneumatic hydraulic press, which was really great. And um, so I started thinking about making these platters through die forming instead of hand smithing them. So I was able to get um, large aluminum dies, laser cut. And um, so it doesn't look like, it's hard to tell with scale, but that's about a two foot die and was able to form these really large pieces where if you were to smith that, it would take um, maybe days. Here I could make it in 30 seconds. And Part of the neat conversation about changing your space and where you are, so I was at this community center and there were a lot of um, uh, artists, there was a machinist, there were people that were just trying to get some new skills, but they were, they were working, hustling, trying to sell their work and just surviving. And you know, a couple of them were watching me smith these like large platters and they're like, Jessica, what the heck are you doing? Like you are, it, when was it? It was the early 2000s. This is the 2000s. You need to um, start thinking about ways to move your practice along. And that, that was actually what sort of forced me to start thinking about using laser cutting and water jet cutting in my work. And uh, without that conversation, I, I think maybe eventually I would have gotten there, but it would have taken a lot longer. So I, um, yeah, I started learning Illustrator and some really basic CAD programs. And um, if there were ways that I could either cut dyes or cut the shapes of my actual forms, then I was going to do it. And I think that's something that as a craft person is um, an interesting thing to ask yourself is what part of the work do you, your hands need to be on? Like where, where do you need to have your hands in the work and where can you collaborate or pass you know, that work onto some other tool and other, other process in order to uh, be productive or possibly move, the fo move forward in a way that it hadn't. And everyone's line is different. And so I knew that I knew how to smith. I knew that I knew how to cut. And so I was ready. <laughs> so I started making a lot of these files and I would, I would have the work um, hydraulic press. I would have the, the dies cut and then I would send my work back after I was hydraulic forming it to an, a water jet company in order to cut these elaborate edges on my platters. And I was just really kind of enjoying, like how can I add this like new level of complexity? I knew I could do this myself, but I was really enjoying having that dialogue with industry. And I think that started with CIA. With We talked about it in my demo, like being in Cleveland, having that access to industry and understanding that you guys can work together and that um, there can be a really wonderful collaboration that can happen. And I think that's become a really solid part of my studio practice since then. So anyways, these are some of the platters that I made from that. At this time, I had come, I had moved to Kent, Ohio. I had filled in for a sabbatical replacement for Kathleen Brown. And so a lot of this work was made at Kent. And there's some Kent alum here too, which is great. So. Um, anyways, so these were the works, and I still hung them on the wall. I kind of thought about making these platters, and these consumption commentaries, and I wanted them to read kind of like the way a grandma would hang a lot of their porcelain plates. My grandma did that, and um, sort of hung them salon style. So uh, on, the, on the right is an image of just how they were connected to the wall. As I was starting to show in different places, you know, thinking about uh, security or how things would present and um, uh, have integrity in terms of their structure was really important. So the, with these platters, before I enameled them, I would solder on a copper tube. And then in order to hang them, I would make a telescoping tube that would get secured to the gallery wall. And then there was a, just a pin that would drop through it in order to secure the work. So I enjoy that part of it. I think that's part of myself that I 
um, is not necessarily like a natural inclination to figure out mechanics of things. Um, so I feel like it stretches my brain in ways that it doesn't always want to, but then appreciates it afterwards. So in 2008, I moved to Wisconsin. And I, before that, I had been doing the adjunct hustle and the sabbatical replacements and just trying to find my way and keep working. And so I um, started teaching tenure track at the University of Wisconsin Oshkosh. And um, there are a lot of cows. <laughs> it was very rural. It was a big culture shock. And um, I started to find my way there. And one of the first things that I did was find um, a place where I can um, continue doing laser cutting and water jet cutting. And I talked a little bit about an, of that in my demo, so I won't rehash it, because I see a lot of similar faces. But anyways, I was working with steel and copper, trying to really push layering and scale. So these are some of the some of the works that came out of that time. And it was kind of the end of my series with these platters. I feel like I kind of um, worked it to death. And so anyways, um, just on a, on a personal level, uh, my husband, I've been married to him actually since I had just finished from the Cleveland Art Institute. We got married, I got married really young in 2001. And uh, uh, he's from Morocco originally. And we have been taking trips to Morocco, I don't know, as much as we could afford, like every other year. So we could go visit his family. And, um, and I was obviously like thrilled to go explore this other country. and. Um, that was just kind of a, a part of my life, and we would spend these really long periods of summer in in his mom's backyard. <laughs> like, spend a lot of time in her backyard, and it's if you've never been to North Africa, it's the weather is very much like Los Angeles. It's very like temperate Mediterranean. It's very beautiful. There are she's also my mother-in-law is a master gardener, and then culturally. Uh, the language of choice is a combination of Arabic and French. So when you are speaking with someone, they might switch between the language mid-sentence. And so I do not speak fluently enough to really carry on a conversation with anyone besides asking where the bathroom is. So there would be a lot of family visits where I would be sitting in the backyard for like hours and then days. <laughs> and, and it's not a tourist visit, it's a family visit, so I'm just there and uh, eating cookies and drinking a lot of delicious tea and um, feeling really alienated. So I would do a lot of sketches in, in her backyard. And so for me to pass the time, I would always have my sketchbook and I would have gouache and watercolor sets. And I would just do all these like drawings and paintings when I was there and I never would think about it. And it just felt like this other thing that I did to pass the time. And, uh, um, and then I finally kind of bubbled and marinated and as this other work was drawing to an end, I started thinking about the sketches I was doing. And on another personal level, at the same time, um, I, I had my first child. So I currently have two kids. One's five and one's eight. And, um, and so I was going through a lot of these life changes that really influenced my work pretty dramatically. And so this is just kind of a shot of my studio. I had a studio in my basement. I worked mostly at home and a little bit from my school. And I was teaching full time. And so after what felt like an eternity of a maternity leave, I got back into the studio and I could no longer make the work that I was making before. It just didn't make any sense. It wasn't relevant. And I um, had a really hard time trying to rectify what was going on in my personal life and how do I really um, make that relevant in my studio practice. So I started doing these sketches where I was combining some of the drawings from my travels in Morocco with fragments of myself. And I think it was really kind of trying to uh, work through what it feels like to be a woman who uh, lives in a complicated world. And so there was this conflict between my time being um, at home with my kids where all of a sudden I felt like I was no longer Jessica, I was no longer the professor, I was no longer the artist, I was just mom. I was just this milky mom. <laughs> and it was tough. It was really tough. 
And so I had to make work about it. And so I don't want to say this is my therapy, but it was just kind of expressing what I was going through and trying to take what was outside and inside and bring it out and hope that, uh, that a lot of people would understand where I was coming from. So I started thinking about them having these narrative and this character. So there was this like constant where there were all these legs, these legs with these black shoes. And she became this character who changed depending on the wind and the season. So. Um, yeah, so I started making these pieces that I didn't really know where they were going or how they would be received, uh, but part of it really felt right. And so I, um, I think working in a painterly mode is definitely my comfort zone. And so I was able to work through a lot in terms of thinking about gesture and color. I was thinking about the language of flowers, that the, the floral is such a historically like feminine symbol. And so I started thinking about how I could really uh, use that language to talk about what I was what I was thinking about and feeling, which was that I was feeling big and stupid. And but then everyone was telling me that I was this must be the most beautiful time in your life. You must be so happy. And I was completely at odds with that. And so I was trying to make these images where, like, a part of the female is just completely taken away and it's just uh, obscured and it's just sort of censored, but it's pretty. And what do you do with that? So that's kind of where I was going with the work. And that I was also playing with process that I was still kind of really enjoying. So this is seed beads that were cold connected into my images. And this was, maybe people in academia could relate, this was after a very terrible department meeting where I felt like I wanted to bang my head against the wall. <laughs> that had nothing to do with being a mom, but anyways. <laughs> And so, I, I, again, I was kind of working through gesture, thinking about should there be other characters that interact with this, with this being. Um, uh, you know, it was just kind of feeling things out and um, really kind of enjoying, like, picking a palette. I was thinking about colors that were kind of ironically, like, a candy sweet, like thinking about pastels and that being part of the dialogue. Thinking about obscuring different parts of the body in different ways, just um, having fun and playing with composition as well. So also, again, kind of looking at format change in um, presentation and mode. And for those of you who saw my demo, all of this is the process that I showed this morning in terms of that layering of underglaze and china paint. Here, this is also using electroforming. So I was setting these pieces with prongs um, of copper wire and then electroforming the whole piece and then just um, resisting anything that was the enamel. So then the prongs kind of became these flower forms. So, um, looking at uh, historical works to kind of seat the devices that I was using. So I've always been a fan of Renee Magritte. And contemporary artists like Laura Ford, who's a British sculptor, who works in the round and in installation and um, another Ohioan and Hamilton more working in a performative way, but in a way that I was really um, resonating with and understanding. And from a Smith perspective, the work of David Frieda for technical, if you don't know his work, you should. Um, he's an amazing, amazing metalsmith and enamelist, and um, he has a, currently has a contract with um, Tiffany and Company to make these limited edition uh, floral pins that are just unbelievable. And also thinking about material. And at this point, I was starting to think about why do I use enamel and metal? And I kind of had the feeling that I was using it as a crutch, that I was working in something that I just knew, and it was convenient, because I knew how to manipulate it. But maybe it wasn't always the best choice. And I was also thinking about uh, what Matthew said this morning about the material is the meaning, you know, and that like artists like Liza Liu, she's working all completely in seed beads and glass beads and creating these domestic spaces, but it, the material was crucial to that interpretation of the work of this really domestic space and this really kind of um, like domestic DIY craft material. And um, anyways, I just kind of all this stuff was sort of like marinating in my head. And, and so looking at some of those works, including the cave, and I was like, I got to make this in the round. Like this has to be big and like, intimidating and so this was one of the first pieces that I made so it's a little bit smaller than human scale and I started to stretch myself I started thinking about working in ceramics so I, I hand built the legs out of earthenware 
and then I built the this large fiberglass form and I still worked in enamel for the flowers and um, but those were cold connected into this mixed media piece so this is the first iteration and I was kind of excited about it and I made it in a really dumb way <laughs> and I connected all of the legs permanently and so I had to make this enormous crate with this very fragile thing and so I could never show it anywhere that I couldn't drive it to and so I was it was good. I mean, I had to do that in order to make the next work. So I started thinking about different ways to make them in parts so that I could construct them on site and then break them up into different pieces. And so with each of these, the legs are separate and they get screwed into a pedestal and uh, they don't break then. And I can have small boxes that I can afford to ship. So anyways, and I, I continued the idea of thinking about different craft materials. So there's, this is made out of felt, felted wool and porcelain and um, I learned that from a really great metalsmith named Masako Onodera so if you don't know her work she does a lot of really wonderful work with hard and soft materials so um, I was thinking about craft materials and their relationship to women's work and kind of looking at artists like Judy Chicago, Miriam Shapiro, first generation feminist how can I take what was learned from that and move that a little bit forward and um, that was kind of how I was making decisions about my materials like I would never make something with Casper arms for this work it didn't make sense so that part was really important to me so I started thinking about just different shapes and what does that say so a fiberglass this was also this was a mix of um, silk and enamel and copper and ceramic and I was still having a problem though because my my earthenware legs were breaking so I was kind of running into a roadblock of um, sort of a lack of skill in that particular craft. So I went back to Kohler. I had my first sabbatical. I had achieved tenure at um, Wisconsin, Oshkosh. And so I, in the fall of 2014, I was able to go back to Kohler in the ceramic side. I learned about slip casting. I learned about high fire porcelain, which was amazing. It was really hard. At that point, I had two kids and I was driving to Kohler every day for an hour and a half doing my work and then driving back so I could still be home for dinner. And um, it was a different kind of residency than when I was in my 20s, um, but I got a lot out of it. So I, I got the technical still, skill that I needed, and I also was able to play a little bit. So some of the things that I was demoing in the morning, like using china paints, I was actually trying to see how that actually worked on china and porcelain, and how does that material that I knew so well in enamel work on a clay substrate, and that was wonderful, and I really enjoyed it. And um, this is one of the larger pieces that I made that was acquired by the John Michael Kohler Art Center. And, uh, and so then I had really strong legs, <laughs> but then I didn't have a place to work again um, because to make those large scale slip cast molds on human scale is a really physical task and you need big facilities for it. But one thing that I did take away from it was that I was able to make, I made these little mini molds when I was there. I made maquettes to test out my bigger project and I just had these parts that I hadn't considered. So when I was back home in my basement again, um, like these are Barbie doll legs, so just for scale reference, I was able to think about working on this miniature scale that I thought was really interesting. So I actually continued my journey on this mini scale. So you can see they're about seven to eight inches tall. And um, what I loved about it was actually it really changed the way you read the work when it was this big versus on this human scale. And I, someone had at one point had called them dolls, which made me like cringe. And then I said, yeah, okay, actually, yeah, that actually works. I see that. And so I was able to work really fast and I was able to explore materials. I started expanding. So this is polymer clay, which is, um, has a really interesting sort of reference in, in craft materials is pretty low on the totem pole, so I loved that. And, um, and to be quite honest with you, when you're a mom and you're working in your basement and you're thinking about things that you can do when your kids are around, that's actually part of the experience. So we would do polymer clay together and I'd be making like hundreds of these little, um, whatever you want to call them, these grape forms while my kids are making crazy polymer monsters. And it worked. So anyways, this was really wonderful in terms of a way for me to explore. This piece is part of Boris Valley's Imagine Peace Now project. So these are um, uh, gun barrels that were then slipcast and incorporated. 
and I started bringing enamel back into it again. Like I felt like I had to go far away from it in order to swing back around. And so again, like these are, I'm still using a lot of industry, so these are just uh, water jet cut. So I end up just making really simple drawings and sending out these multiples, and then I get them back and do the rest of the work. And I think about like ways to make connections with the work that has structural integrity, but also adds to the meaning. So these are all put together with sewing head pins. So I use like plastic and glass pins that get threaded through and crimped. And I don't make all this work alone. I, well, I am now, but at many points during this work, I hire students that have graduated recently in my program. So they'll work with me in my studio and I pay them a decent wage and they would help me with some of the repetitive work. So that way I could actually um, finish something. <laughs> So at the same time, I still work in jewelry. So my studio practice is kind of ADD. So I, I work in wearable, I work in sculpture, and I work in wall work, but it all has a conversation. And so I'm able to make decisions uh, between the work so that they're all kind of speaking to each other in a way that works for me. Um, and I, and I, as I was continuing to make jewelry, I was always really, and I always make brooches. I make brooches because I like I like the format of the work. It's like a miniature sculpture or a miniature painting for me. And I, I like to make what I would wear. And so that's, I wear pins. And um, I always had trouble though with the mechanisms being an interruption to the front and back relationship. And so as also part of my travels, I was collecting jewelry when I was there, of course. So I started collecting um, Moroccan fibules. So here's examples of it. And then just to see a scale reference, because that's really helpful. Um, that's how they're worn on the body. So they're usually in pairs that are symmetrical. And it's a really ancient mechanism. I saw there was a student work in metals that was using this, um, this mechanism, which was really exciting to see. So anyways, I totally appropriated it and um, decided to use it as a way to make a piece that had a front and back relationship. So I wanted to rectify what I was doing sculpturally, which was what I was doing pictorially. So having one side that was an image and one side that was a tactile texture was a way for me to kind of bring those two modes together. So um, that was happening at the same time that the sculptural works were happening. So bringing in polymer, seed beads on the textured side, and then still working with china paints and underglazes on the other. So, so how it's worn, it's really red. <laughs> so anyways, yeah, so that's kind of, uh, the, the gist of that series, but what was really exciting was that towards the end of this work, the, a culminating exhibition was um, a solo show at the Racine Art Museum. And I was invited by the curator there, Lena Vigna, to uh, propose an installation in their um, windows gallery. So it's kind of neat. It's, it's, it's also kind of intimidating. It's 90 feet long, and it's um, an exhibition that you can see both from the street view and also the inside of the gallery view and um, it's neat you can do a drive-by and that and see the whole show and not even pay admission so it's kind of like art art exhibition for the people and what was challenging about it was that there was a 30 inches of depth nothing could hang on the wall so it either had to suspend or be freestanding. And uh, I had a year in advance to come up with a, a plan and then to execute it. And it was, it was well funded and they were incredibly supportive. And if you're not familiar with the Racine Art Museum, uh, acclimate yourself if you're a craft person because the, the director and the curators are huge cheerleaders of craft and they collect and they exhibit. And it's about an hour north of Chicago. So if you're ever there, take a little field trip to Racine, it's well worth it. So anyways, I was, I was really kind of struggling with filling that space in a way that felt right to me. So I actually ended up making a friends with a guy who lived pretty close to my house who was an antique enamel signed resort, restorer, which was really random. And he had this huge kiln. And I said, hey, I have this commission. Um, can, I, can I use your space in exchange for something? And uh, he said, absolutely. So I started thinking about making these really large um, hanging enamel pieces. So these are laser cut steel with porcelain enamel. And um, these pieces, again, working with that same palette and iconography, became these, like, these large hanging panels that were part of that exhibition. So 
So at, at the same time that I was installing this show, which was in 2016, I had accepted a job at Ball State University as an associate professor. So I, I was finishing this show. I packed up my house. I sold my house. I moved my family <laughs> to Muncie, Indiana, and I installed this exhibition and then started teaching at a new program. Um, so it was a pretty intense time, and I, I'm, I'm, I don't know. It was, it was really hard, but I'm glad that I did it. And so here's just some shots of the work. I was able to make these really great custom pedestals that um, supported the work, but then also I'd always wanted something to be in the round, but I never quite had the funds to move that idea forward. So this is just kind of shots of bef like install and then after. And part of that deal is also that works up for one year, but then it, after six months there's a change out. So something had to something had to change in the installation during that time. So one way for me to get around that was that when I was at Kohler, I had slip cast these large spherical forms that had holes drilled into it. So I was able to cold connect these little porcelain forms or seed pods, which you can kind of see there. So then when I was at the time to change out, instead of adding entirely new work, I could take off those seed pods and then put in these entirely new forms. And so that's actually part of this series is that every time I have an exhibition with these, the it's different. And it just depends on what components I have and how I see them coming together. So I will be coming back to CIA uh, sometime at the end of October to install um, a few of these figures and we'll see what they are <laughs> at the time. I'm not really sure. So yeah, so currently I teach full-time at Ball State University and it's, um, it's a material specific program with um, bachelor and um, MFA program in metals and ceramics and glass and sculpture. And so it's a really vibrant program and um, really wonderful colleagues and the architecture of the campus really encourages a lot of um, cross-disciplinary practice and collaboration. So currently I'm collaborating with some of the glass professors and students and I'm starting to reinterpret some of those small um, brooches that had stone settings around the perimeter and um, scale shifting those up to be these large wall works with um, blown glass elements. So that's right in the works and that's what's on the bench right now. And then also for opportunities for you, for those of you who are out of school or are going to be graduating soon, we have a new residency program. So if any student is looking for an opportunity, there's um, a program for emerging artists and for more mid-career artists that can run from anywhere from three weeks to three months and include a travel stipend and small honorarium and housing. So if anyone's interested in that, I will be here for the extent of the symposium and ask me questions if you are interested. So anyways, thank you so much for coming and for um, paying attention. <laughs> thank you.